In this lesson, we're gonna improve the user experience around searching for trips by allowing the user to trigger a filters sheet and even give them the ability if no search results appear to clear out all the filters. So the first thing for us to do is to add to this icon here, which is going to launch the sheet that is housing our filters. So I'm gonna add that as a trailing button in our app bar here. And as you might guess, it'll be an icon. And the one that I'm looking for here is sliders, horizontal. As a reminder, you can always go to the website of the icon library that you're using and type in some keyword that relates to the icon that you wanna use. In Phosphor's case, there's a few that we could choose from here. I just think the sliders horizontal works best in our application. And I'm gonna change the color here to black. Now, what I'm also gonna do here right away is I'm going to add a background color and we'll just set this to our background color style here and then add a bunch of roundness. And then with our icon size locked at 24, I'm going to add a fixed width and a fixed height for our icon here. And I'm gonna add 44 for both. Now, this is a general best practice for clickable elements like this is to make them at least 44 pixels high and 44 pixels wide, which gives your users enough surface area to be able to reliably tap on it. If you go smaller than this, then there's a greater chance that they're gonna miss when they try to hit the icon or hit the button, and that's just gonna lead to frustration. So best practices, Apple recommends 44 pixels, Google actually recommends 48 pixels, but as long as you're going around that 44 pixel size, you should be okay. Now that we've got our filters button set up, I want to add a sheet which is going to house all of the filters. So this can be our sheet filters. And looking at our reference design here, we've got what looks like a few elements here within a row. So I'm gonna start by adding a group to the top here, which we can just call group top. And in it, I'm going to have a button which is going to clear all of the filters out. And I'm gonna set this to be a link light primary. And I actually don't wanna have this be orange. So I actually want it to be dark like this. So what I might do is actually detach this and create a new style that I know that I'm probably gonna use in other places. And this can be link light secondary in contrast to the link light primary which uses our primary color the secondary here corresponds to the fact that i'll be using this for not primary actions on the page like in our reference design you can see that our primary action here has our primary color this orange color and that's because this is what we want to stand out to the user this is just a secondary action. It's not as important and therefore we can use a color like that black that is de-emphasized relative to the primary. So that's gonna be our clear button. And as before, you can see that the minimum height by default here is 44 pixels, which is good from the perspective of being clickable. I'm just gonna fit the width to the content as well. And when I do that, you can see that when I hover over the button, it's actually only 44 pixels across. So I could, I could give it a fixed width here, but I think I'll actually go even a little bit larger and just expand the width by adding some padding to this button. Next, we'll add a text element and let's make sure that our group top here is not a column, but in fact a row. And our text element here, I'm just gonna hit next to move it over in this list. This is literally just gonna say filters, just to give some context as to what the user's expected to do in this sheet. And I'll give it this heading six. And then I'll add a button as well. And I'm gonna set this again to be that style that we just created, because what I want is for the icon to appear here to be dark. And you can see actually when we created this style, we didn't set the icon color. So on the fly here, I can just go and edit the style and set the icon color here to be that text color, same as the font color. And that means that now if I choose here an icon like this X icon, because I want this to be the icon 
that is used to close the sheet and things will work accordingly. And I'll also give this a fixed width here of 44 pixels. And then we need to spread all of these guys out. So what I'm gonna do is make sure that the container alignment here is space between. That's gonna push the first and last elements button clear and this button close to the far edges of the group of the container. And then anything in between like this text is just gonna hover here in the middle. Now you can see one problem is that this middle text element is slightly offset from the center. That's because our button clear here is a different size to our button close. And so one way that I can solve this is by actually putting this button close here inside of another group. It doesn't really matter if it's a row or a column. And I'm gonna set the width of this group to be the same width as for this clear button. So that would be 73 pixels. And you can see here that now this filters heading is actually in the middle. And that's because both elements on either side of it, this button clear and this new group are both 73 pixels. So the spacing is balanced on either side. Then all we need to do is inside of this group, just make sure that the icon is sitting over on the right hand side. And then our filter sheet looks like it's working. Also, some of you might be asking, why am I using a button for this icon and not just an icon element? Well, the reason is that when we use a button, we can actually control the icon size and the size of the element itself independently. Whereas with an icon, all we can control is the size of the icon element and the actual visible icon and size is just going to expand to fit the size of the element. So that's why I prefer to use a button. Now let's hook up this close button as well. So I'm gonna add a workflow to hide the sheet. So hide an element, we're gonna hide that sheet filters. And then let's add the inverse action here on our trailing button, which we set up before. And this action predictably is going to show that filters sheet. And if we test this out, we should be able to click on that filters button. That's gonna bring up the sheet. And then we can hit this close icon in order to close it again. Now I might just make another couple of small adjustments here just to decrease the size between this top row and the top of the sheet and also just increase the size of this icon slightly. So I'm gonna change the icon size here to 32. It's a little easier to see. Now the other thing to note is that our icon isn't quite in line with the content on the page here. What we really want is for the edge of the icon to be in line with their content underneath. And this kind of thing, just making our content aligned, can go a long way in improving the design of our application, just making it look a lot more cohesive. So with icons like this, because we can't control the position of the icon itself within the element, what you can always do is just add a little bit of margin and then just literally with your eyeball, just see, hey, does that line up? And for me, I think that it does. And then finally, we can actually move this top group up slightly by again, adding some margin, but with a negative sign before it. So we're literally just gonna add a little bit of negative margin, which is gonna pull the group up. And so, yeah, I think that looks pretty good. Now we just need to get this selectable list for the trip filter inside of our sheet. So I'm literally just going to, within the elements tree here, just drag it and place it inside of our filters sheet. And then let's make sure here that it's sitting below the top bar. And because all we've done is rearrange this within the interface, our vertical list data source here should still be connected, and it is, to the selectable list output. And what that means is that if I open up the filters sheet and I select things here, then you can see that the content underneath is changing immediately. While we're here, let's also just remember to set this to be fit height to content for the content inside of the sheet, which it was doing anyway, but let's just be explicit about it. The only thing that we might want to do is just add some logic so that when one of these list items is selected, we're gonna hide the sheet. 
So to do that, it's very simple. With the selectable list item element selected, we're going to add a workflow. And that workflow is going to correspond to that item being tapped. And in this situation, we can simply hide the sheet. So if we try this out, this is then the behavior that we get. Now, there's a few little things here we can do to improve the user experience. So the first thing we might wanna do is just connect up this clear button so that it resets the value of the selectable list. In essence, we need to set the value of the selectable list to be empty, to be nothing. And what we would expect then is that this type filter will become ignored again since we have ignore empty constraints turned on. And this is something that we covered in the previous lesson. And thankfully for us, if we go and we add a workflow to when this clear button is tapped, we actually have an action on this selectable list element, which is unselect all. And we have to choose what selectable list we want to unselect all the options for. There's only one on this view, so it's being automatically selected there for us. And then after we unselect them, we probably want to again hide that sheet of filters. So I'll add filter here, family and friends, and I'll now tap that clear button. And you see that we are seeing all the trips again and the sheet was hidden. We could also show some kind of visual indicator on this trailing button whenever there are filters applied. And we can do that under the conditional tab by just simply looking to see whether that selectable list actually has a selected choice that is not empty. And then we can add some styling properties that suggest that there has been some filters applied. And one of the ways that we can do this is by changing both the icon color to our primary icon color and also adding a border of that same color. So I'll set here the border to be solid. I'll also set the color here to be that primary color. And so if we add a filter now, you see this is the effect that we get, but that gray background still looks a little strange to me. And so we can set that background to be some light version of our primary color. And this is where all of those color variables that we set up right at the beginning of the course become useful because I have here a really light version of my primary orange brand color that I can use here. And that means that now when I activate the filter, you can see that it very clearly indicates that we have got filters being applied. And when I clear out all the filters, it returns to normal. And then the other thing that we have to tidy up here is that if I choose a filter option like staycation that results in no trips being returned, well, we're seeing this empty state group appear, which we had set up earlier in the course. Now, if you recall, the logic for displaying that is simply looking at the number of trips within our vertical list. But this condition is clearly not gonna cut it anymore because it will also be true when we are filtering out all of the trips. So we need to amend our conditional logic here. And what if we did something like this? When that list of trips is empty and we've got a value in that selectable list filter, well, then we would show something like this. We would assume that it's empty because of the filters that the user has applied. Otherwise, right, if that list of trips is empty and there is no filter value selected, then we show this group, this group prompting the user to add their first trip. So in our group header here above our existing empty state group, I'm just gonna paste in a group that I have prepared earlier, it just has a text element and a button in it. And let's add a condition here. This is gonna be no search results. Let's add a condition which says, again, right, is that vertical list of trips empty? In other words, is the list of trips, when we count them all up in that list, is it less than one? 
okay? And then we can add an AND operator. So we can combine two conditions together here and this overall condition will only be true if both of these statements are true. So when the count of trips is less than one and when that selectable list element has its selected choice value being not empty. In other words, the user has selected a filter value and that's caused this list of trips to not return any results. In that case, we're gonna tell the user that, hey, you can't see anything because your filters have filtered out all of the trips. So we're gonna set here the visibility property of this element. And then we're also going to make sure that it's not visible here on page load. And then for our empty state group, we could do the opposite. So we could amend this condition to say, and that selectable list selected choice, right? is empty in this case, right? So the user hasn't added any filters, but nothing is appearing here in this list of trips. So we should be safe to assume that's because the user hasn't created even one trip yet. And then while we're here, while we're here, let's also just hook up this clear filters button so the user can hit this in order to clear the value of that selectable list element. So we'll go unselect all on that selectable list element. So I'll test this by adding that staycation filter and you can see here that indeed we're seeing the appropriate message. If I hit clear filters, well that's going to clear the selectable list element. So now we're viewing all trips again. And then if I was to log out here and if I sign up here as a new user, then we are seeing the message saying that, hey, you haven't added any trips yet. Now, in the next lesson, we're gonna tweak the search logic such that a user can add more than one search constraint or search filter. And these will only be applied once they actually take some further action like hitting this apply filters button. So we'll see you in the next lesson.